Well, good evening, good morning, happy Sabbath, or happy after Sabbath, whatever it may be for the different people who are joining us here. Uh, this is... Good morning. Good evening. Yeah. This, this is our main service here. Now, people need to remember to keep off your mics. You guys are pretty good at that. So remember to keep off your mics unless you, you happen to have something to say. I'm going to start. So somebody put the mic on back there. Um, I'm going to begin with a scripture song, as you see here. And when I do that, I have to change my audio settings so that you can actually hear the guitar. So hopefully the furnace doesn't come on. And there we go. <laughs> so this scripture song from 1 John chapter 3 um, is addressing the topic of the sermon today, which is going to be on love. So I'm going to sing the scripture song, then I will have a prayer, and then I'll present the message. Behold what manner of God the Father has bestowed on us. We should be called the sons of God, sons of God. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Behold what man love the Father has bestowed. Upon us, that we should be called sons of God, sons of God. Beloved, now we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Behold what man love the Father has bestowed upon us, the sons of God. And let's let's pray together. Dear Father in heaven, we invite your spirit to be here in our meeting, and we are thankful for the blessings that we received in the Sabbath school, the light that is shining upon our path, and we're grateful for those that are searching for light and receiving it. We just ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can speak now to the hearts, and that we can receive a power and a conviction. Um in our lives, that we can obey thy voice and walk in thy ways. I pray, Lord, that um, not only can you have listening ears and an open heart, but that you can give me words to speak that are uh, words bred in due season, something that can feed us and sustain us. I pray, Lord, that each person will study these things for themselves come to know you personally as their Savior. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. 
Amén. Well, good evening, good morning, happy Sabbath. Um, so I welcome everyone here to this study. And we're going to be uh, looking at a topic. I've actually did this, this um, sermon back in May 10th, uh, 2014. So it's nearly 10 years ago. And, and the last time I had edited my notes or looked at my notes was uh, exactly seven years ago to the day. It was November 11th, 2017 that I had, uh, I guess, copied or edited the file that uh, I'm using my sermon notes. I'm going to be using eSword here. Now, of course, this is a sermon, and I was listening to what Dwight was presenting and the questions. Now, of course, uh, the work of the Holy Spirit is uh, to convict us of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. Uh, the work of the Holy Spirit does this through giving us light. And that light that comes through God's word, whether it's the law and the prophets, uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Or if we're going to be looking at in our time, the Bible in the spirit of prophecy. This is all the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, the topic here today is love. And I addressed this topic in the past in, in, a, in a couple of sermons. One was called Part Love, Love Part One and Love Part Two. Um, because often this word is used in a, a casual manner. You know, I love my dog. I love this meal. Uh, those types of things. But the word in, in, in the Bible, which we see here, is charity. And we're going to read through this. Um, this word is a self-sacrificing love. It's a much different love than the casual love uh, that we see today. But I'm going to read the scripture, and then we're going to do a short study on this. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity or love, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profits me nothing. Charity suffereth long, is kind, charity envies not, charity brags not itself, is not puffed up. And I'm just going to switch here. I think I ended up using a different translation here, but um, vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Uh, doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not its own, not her own, is not easily provoked, and thinketh no evil. Charity rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity, or love, never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know, even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. 
Now, we're probably all familiar with this chapter, the love chapter. Um, and it is describing love, but it's describing a love that is beyond our ability to comprehend. Because we are just children. And so he uses this illustration. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. We only know in part. Our, our knowledge is limited. The, the understanding that we have in this movement of Millerite history and um, of chronology of the Bible, all of these things are meaningless without love. And we have talked about this as in the Friday night studies as we have gone through A.T. Jones, 1895 General Conference Bulletin, specifically, though, all of the other things we've studied on righteousness by faith, that Christ's righteousness is far above anything that man could possibly produce. It's perfect righteousness, and that we need this perfect righteousness. So this sermon is addressing uh, this point, how what God's plan of salvation is, and why men's plans of saving themselves are insufficient. So we know love, the love that we're talking about here, is not something that's shallow. Indeed, uh, love is a gift of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So I'm just going to go there. So let's, let's go there. We're going to take our time to look at these verses. So we're all familiar with John 3.16. Again, a very popular verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth him on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. We talked about this last night, and not, no, not everybody follows the Friday night studies. But one of the things that uh, is being taught uh, by, well, specifically the 1888 message study committee is this idea that Jesus has legally justified all men, that we are not condemned at all because of what Christ has done on the cross. And that that contradicts God's plain words. They try to teach that it's easier to be saved than to be lost, which we know that the Bible teaches that the way to life is narrow and few there be that find it. And the way to death is wide and broad. Many there be that go thereby. Right. So we know that the Bible contradicts that view. Now, the reason why men are condemned is that we love darkness rather than light that is the condition that we are in because of our sin we are not justified until we receive the light that is the light of justification so i don't want to be too te technical here i just want to go through some of these verses so we know in uh john chapter one Verse 14 talks about this as well. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So this glory we know is his character. It is 
the character of the Father that we behold when we see Christ in the flesh. So Jesus Christ came in the world to proclaim his Father's character, to proclaim God's love. But the question is, what is the character of God? In 1 John 4, verse 8, um, we find this passage. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. So God's very nature is love. God does not just love but he is very different. It is his essence. His character is completely contrary to man's character. And of course, we, sh we should all realize this. Uh, we have seen it demonstrated in our, our own lives and the lives of others every day. Um, the love of God then is his character, his glory. It is what distinguishes him from man. It is innate. It is what he is made of, his very substance or essence. God is love. He doesn't just love. He's not God and he has love. He is love. Now, the question that we, we look at, if God is love um, by his very nature, what are we? So we are not God. We are totally opposed to God in every way. And we need to look at this and understand it very clearly. So in Romans chapter 8, um, verses 6 and 7. <clears throat> so I'm just going to go back a little bit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded, that is fleshly minded, is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Sorry about that. I just got to do something here with the audio settings. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. That is, we cannot in the flesh, in our nature, meet up to the standard of God's righteousness, his love. Now, of course, we all know this, uh, but we, we have more verses that we can use to establish this. And I'm not going to go there, but we know Romans 3.23 for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, of his character, of the love of God. In 1 John 2, verse 4, um, we find this as well. He that saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So one thing, we can know that if we truly knew God, we would be different than we are. And we also know that we are liars. We claim to be righteous. We believe, at least we try to convince ourselves, that we're okay. But the reality is we're far from God in character. In James 1, verse 23, he addresses this idea as well. So James 1, 23. Um, so let's go back a little bit further. We'll start at verse 19. Um, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Now, of course, that would be different with God's wrath. 
God's wrath does work his righteousness. It comes from his character. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass, in a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth in therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of this work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So we know that when we look at ourselves in this mirror, the, the law of liberty, we should see ourselves as we are, which is a sinner. And so this is the light that has come. This is the character of God that is in a deep contrast with our character. Um, in John 3, uh, verses 19 and 20. A familiar verse as well. Uh, this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. This is, to me, one of the, the fundamental principles of the problem of sin is that we love darkness because our deeds are evil. So what's, what's the problem? You know, so God is love and we are sinners. Their light and darkness are incompatible. And we know that religion has tried to solve this problem. All the various religions of the world, everything from atheism to Zen Buddhism, tries to address this problem of evil that exists within the human heart. Now, the problem here is man's attempts to solve the problem are going to be different than God's solution. So what does man do? Uh, Adam used a fig leaf, right, to cover his nakedness. People have all kinds of philosophies to make the world a better place. We have communism, we have different forms of humanism, all kinds of political means all kinds of self-help books that exist that are trying to, to deal with this problem, but those are all man's solutions. And since man is not God, his solutions will never solve the sin problem. We cannot save ourselves. Salvation is an act of God alone. Now, man's attempts to solve the problem, those can seem noble, some of them. But since they're a result of our nature, which is a sinful nature, they can never bring about uh, the goal that we seek. In Jeremiah 13, 23, Jeremiah says, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. So we know that we have to have God's solution to this problem. <clears throat> now, if we think about it, man's attempts to solve the problem are the result of our nature. That is, we can't act any differently than our nature. And we should then recognize that God's solution is consistent with his nature and comes forth from his very nature, which is love. God's solution to the sin problem can be described as love. Now, this is not man's solution. 
Man does not like the idea of love, self-sacrificing love, the love of God. Because even when man calls his solution love, it is always a cheap imitation. Maybe even more than that, it is always based upon selfishness and self. Tinkling, tinkling instrument. <laughs> What's that? I said a tinkling instrument. Yeah, tinkling instrument. Yes. Okay. So, so often we talk about love, and we can see that we, we talked about a bit about this last night, where people have this idea that Christ died on the cross, so they have this idea about what salvation should be like. That He died for every man, and He has justified every man. This is what uh, people like Jack Secura teach: that every man is legally or forensically justified. That it's easier to be saved than it is to be lost. These ideas which sound good on the surface. But these ideas lead to that God does not kill. There are people who believe that, that God is not going to destroy. He never kills anyone. Even at the end of the world, when the wicked are destroyed, God doesn't do that. Even though we have many statements in the scriptures that say this. So people have these ideas about what love is. That is, we don't really understand this type of love that God has. And so we want a love that is going to not have a cross. We, we call our solution love. We talk about this love. But it doesn't fit our idea of love. Actually, God's solution to the sin problem is, and, and our solution are opposed to each other. And so part of what God has to do is he has to help us to understand his remedy for sin. That's part of his work. That's part of his solution. So since this is contrary to our nature, it's not easy. It is not easy for a person who is a sinner, who is so far from God in character, to be saved. It's not an easy thing. Now, God is able to save unto the uttermost all who come unto him. But just because God can do it, and just because he will do it in our lives, we cannot say it is easy. We know that the problem lies with us, but God is seeking in every way to address that problem of our character. So God is love, and we are not, and his solution must pro provide a bridge, involve an exchange, and do something that can only be classed as miraculous or supernatural. Salvation is not a natural work. It is a supernatural work. If God had left us to our own nature, all that we would, all that we could do is just die. We could not have life. Okay, so when we talk about this, it's an easy thing to talk about. We can talk about God's solution is love. Um, but God doesn't just talk about it. He demonstrates it. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now, there's lots of talk within Christianity, within Adventism, even within conservative Adventism, about what this means, that Christ was made flesh. We talk about the cross, that Christ suffered on the cross. But we have not understood the cross, of what it means. We have avoided the cross. It's something that Christ does. But unless we participate in his sufferings, the fellowship of his sufferings, we cannot appreciate the cross. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find 
rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's look at that verse. So it's in Matthew. Now is, is it 2011 verse 28 to 30? Yes. So when we look at this verse here, what is this yoke that we are to take up? Is it not the cross? Definitely. It's definitely the cross. And, and this yoke is something that binds us to Christ. It binds a yoke, can bind two oxen together. And it evens out the work, so to speak, for the oxen. Now, of course, we have nothing to offer in this exchange other than to yoke up with Christ and to work with him. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. So once we yoke up with Christ, we begin to learn of him. We start to understand his character. And we can also say that this yoke is tied to the Ten Commandments. The love of the love towards God and the love towards men. Because that's demonstrated on the cross. Now, when we go to the book of Revelation, so let's go there. Um, in the book of Revelation, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. But what does that mean, a revelation of Jesus Christ? Why is the book of Revelation, why does this last book of the Bible call the revelation of Jesus Christ? A revealing of Jesus Christ. Okay, so it's not just something that Jesus Christ reveals. It's not just what Christ is revealing but it's actually a revelation of Christ. It's a revelation of his character. The book of Revelation is, is an amazing book. It's written in symbolic language, right? It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants, uh, Things which must shortly come to pass. So some people just say, well, this is about prophecy. But he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. What does it mean he signified it? What does it mean? He set his seal on it. He approved it. Okay. Um, it's definitely that. But we can see also it is signified. Right? It's written in symbolic language, in signs, in symbols. Right? So this word signified, I just wanted to look it up uh, here. A mark. Right? So it just means it has a mark, a sign. So it's written in symbolic language. And so, and it's given to his servant, John, who is a man who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw, which would be, of course, the gospel of John, not just the book of Revelation. And then a blessing is given. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. And what's going to be shown in this book is the work of Christ for salvation. We're going to see Christ in the midst of the candlesticks of the heavenly sanctuary, his church. We're going to see him upon the table of showbread before the, the, the lamps Right, seven lamps of fire and we're going to see Christ's throne he's going to be seated on this throne in chapter 4 
We're going to see him ministering in the sanctuary with the golden censer, which are the prayers of the saints. All through the book of Revelation is the work of Christ in the sanctuary, working out our salvation in a prophetic message. Because we know the everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. <clears throat> now, we need a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, what a lot of people do is they think, well, what we need to do is just talk about Christ. You know, we, we visualize Christ or we think about Christ. But who is Jesus Christ? What is a revelation of Jesus Christ? If we don't know Christ, how can we, we just imagine him? Is our imaginings of Christ going to be a revelation of Jesus Christ? Should be a revealing a revelation in our lives, revealing of Christ in our lives. So we have, we don't know Christ. So we have, in order to have a revelation of Jesus Christ, we have to understand what Christ is. Now, Ellen White, and I don't have the statement here, but she says we need to reveal to the world Jesus Christ in types and symbols. That is, a revelation of Jesus Christ is not a picture or a drawing of Christ. It is Christ as revealed in prophecy, as revealed through the sanctuary, through his ministration. And so we can't just work up the revelation of Christ, because that would come from our nature. We need to see something where God has intervened in history, in humanity, in our lives, in order for us to have a revelation of Jesus Christ. Christ is has to himself come to us in order for us to have a revelation of Christ. It's not something that we can work up. We can't decide we want to have a revelation of Jesus Christ and spend a lot of time trying to get a re revelation of Jesus Christ. It needs to be Jesus Christ who reveals himself to us, and he has revealed himself to us through the scriptures through prophecy, through his providences. The way that he has worked in our life is a revelation of his character. But often we avoid that revelation of Christ because that revelation of Christ is his character. And since we are sinners, we may not want to see that we are sinners. So we need the gospel. So let's just review a little bit. We know that God is love and we are not love. Our nature, our flesh is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And God has a solution that includes something we call. Yes, somebody has. A yep. Joyce. Is that who? Yes, your mom. Somebody was trying to talk there. Do you have a question or comment? Okay. <clears throat> so we know there has to be a supernatural event before man can possibly even have a slight hope of producing anything that is even close to the obedience of, to God, God's law of love. So something supernatural has to happen. And this is where many people go astray. What they want to have is a change in their nature. If I could just have holy flesh, then I could keep God's law. So they believe that if they had a different nature, they would no longer sin. Well, what kind of nature did Adam have? Did he have a sinful nature before he sinned? Wouldn't Adam have had a sinless nature before he sinned? Right. 
And yet Adam sinned. So even if we had a sinless nature, we could still sin. So a sinless nature isn't going to guarantee that we're not going to be sinners. Now, after Adam sinned, he had a fallen, sinful nature. And Christ took upon himself our nature in its fallen condition and did not in the least participate in its sin. So what did Christ have that even taking a sinful nature, he did not sin? It obviously couldn't be his nature. It would have to be his character. And so what we need is a change in character, not in nature. And the question is, when does this occur? Well, some people think, you know, this change is at conversion. Some at the close of probation, some at the time of Jacob's troubles, some at the second coming. Um, but many of these start with a false premise. Since man is a sinful nature, sinful flesh, and sin is natural, he cannot possibly cease from sin while in this nature. That's why they come up with this idea. We have to actually have a change of nature, not a change of character. And it's true that we have a fallen nature, but it is not true that obedience is impossible while we still have this nature. We can be obedient if we have help. We saw in A.T. Jones studies that Christ never used his own righteousness in order to keep God's law. He depended upon the work of his father. He says, the works that you see me do, they come from the father. Christ set aside his own righteousness so he could be our example. He lived the righteousness, which is by faith. His was his faith in his father's righteousness, in his father's word. So we need some help. And that help is our advocate. Now, we know in, in John's uh, first letter there, he says, I write this to you that ye sin not. Um, now, God, John is outlining in, the, in his first letter, first letter of John, God's solution to the sin problem. And, and I suggest that people read that, uh, the letter of first John, prayerfully and carefully of what it's saying. And he's quite clear that, that we need an advocate We need an advocate. We need this comforter. And this comforter in John's gospel is a reference to the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you comfortless, but I will come unto you. He provide. He comes to us through his Holy Spirit. Um, so let's look at a verse in a little passage in 1 John chapter 3. So 1 John chapter 3, starting at verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested, Christ was manifested, to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not, whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message ye have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. So what we're talking about here is not something that we can work up. 
We can't just change our nature so that we can, that we are sinless. We have to participate in this work of salvation. We have to yoke up with Christ. These are pretty, pretty strong words if you think about it. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. But we all see ourselves as sinners. We all recognize our unlikeness to Christ. And so if we talk of being born again, and yet we know that we are sinners, are we not liars? But we know that we need to be born again. Now, uh, we also have um, in John, 1 John chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. Well, we start at verse one. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Now, this isn't just about the fact that Jesus became a man, but that he took upon himself our nature in its fallen condition. And this is absolutely necessary to recognize that Christ is our brother, that he has taken our nature, that he has been victorious in our flesh, and that it is his victory over our flesh that we trust in, not in our victory over our flesh. We trust in Christ's righteousness, not our own, because all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come. And even now already is in the world. That is the spirit that we see in the world. It it does not recognize the false gospels do not recognize That Jesus Christ came in the same flesh that you and I came and overcame on our behalf that we can trust in his righteousness. And when we do that, when we don't trust in our own righteousness, but in his, a miracle exchange can occur. It may not be seen to us, may not even be felt, but Christ begins to do a work of transforming our characters. And that is the work of sanctification. Okay, Okay, I'm just going to skip because I don't got a lot of time here and I got a lot of notes to go through. I'm going to skip through some of my notes here. Um, This is Romans 6, verse 3 to 7. So let's go there. Okay, well, let's start at verse one. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So we know that we are saved by grace, right? But Paul's quite clear that we don't continue in sin because we're saved by grace. He says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. So this requires a death, a death to self. Can a man crucify himself? We know that 
We are crucified with Christ, but we can't crucify ourselves. We have to look to Christ's crucifixion. We can take up our cross. We can, Paul says, I die daily. That death to self is a daily, uh, moment by moment experience. <clears throat> now, we know that um, this idea about uh, that, that many people look at what John is saying, he's just dealing with Gnosticism. And, and so I don't really want to address that. What I want to address is this idea we see in 1 John chapter 5. So in 1 John chapter 5, he says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. So it means if we believe in Christ, we are born of God. And, and each one of us is going to love God. Christ, we're also going to love um, others that are born of God. For this, by this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God, overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Now, to understand what John means by faith, it's definitely not uh, mere belief. And it's not something you can work up. It's an abiding trust. I'm going to look at Romans chapter 7 and 8 here to close. Don't want to go over time. Now, um, Let's start at verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin, that which I do not allow. For, for that which I do, I allow not, pardon me. And for what I would, that do I not. For what I hate, that I do, or that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. So the fact that we we can see that we are sinners in comparison to the law, we have to acknowledge the righteousness of the law. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Now this is often a misunderstood passage. And if we, we started a bit earlier, we would see that he says, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. So when he says, if I want to do something, he's not talking about his flesh. He's talking about what his mind wants to do. So he knows that there is sin in his flesh, even if he thinks he would like to change. It's sin that is the problem. He says, for I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me. So it wasn't earlier, it's later here. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. This is the situation we find ourselves in, in the flesh. When it comes to our nature, we can find no way to overcome sin. For the good that I would not, uh, for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do not desire to do. That is what I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Now, again, he's just talking about what the mind wants compared to the flesh. So even if I desire to do good, 
The flesh is the problem, our nature. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So Paul is showing here that even though we have this flesh, we don't have to walk after the flesh. So something has to happen, something miraculous. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. For this reason, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, I'm going to close here. Even though there is much more that can be said. Is there any questions about what we have studied here? I, I suggest people read Romans 6 to 8 and think about these things that we are talking about. The fact is Jesus Christ came in human flesh, sinful flesh, that he might destroy sin. Jesus wants to live in our sinful flesh, live individually in us so that he can destroy sin in our lives, just as he did in taking upon sinful flesh he destroyed sin and this is called the new birth now john knew jesus personally he walked with him upon this earth he knew his character and john knew his attitude towards sinners and his attitude towards sin jesus loved sinners but hated sin and the work that he's doing is to remove sin to destroy sin so that sinners may not be destroyed. He does not want to destroy you, but he wants to destroy the thing that is destroying you. And that thing is in your flesh. It is part of your nature, but there is another thing, your character, who you are as a person that Christ is seeking to save. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me, Philippians 4.13. You know, today, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. And we need to take up that cross. We need to yoke up with Christ that we can experience a relationship with him, that we can participate, that we can cooperate with this work that he wants to do in our lives. Let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, the gift of love that came to us as a child, that revealed to us your meekness and lowliness, revealed to us your character. And this child that grew into a man that faced the same things that you and I face, and yet he was victorious at every turn. It depended upon you that trusted in you. We pray, Lord, that work can be accomplished in us. 
by your grace through faith. We pray, Lord, that the love of Christ can be manifest in our lives to those around us. We know, Lord, we are sinners. We see our sin. We confess our sins. We need to know your love. We need to know that it's not a pandering love, but a real love. So we ask, Lord, that you can take our lives, that you can use us to your glory, that your character may be manifest. And we pray for this movement. We pray for the people around the world who are searching for truth. And we just pray, Lord, uh, that we can have a part to play, even if it is a small part, in bringing that light to others. We thank you, Lord, for all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.